get our minds kind of on on God, what we're doing. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, God. Lord, that you still give us this opportunity, that we have a freedom here in America, Lord, where we can preach your word at any time we feel, Lord, God, to any uh, group of people, Lord, God, and we don't have any fear of being locked up or put in prison, and we know that it's not that way throughout the world, Lord. And God, we pray, Lord, that you will bless us, Lord, in this time. Bless us in this time together this morning, Lord. Let your word come forth, Lord. Touch every woman's heart here, God, this morning, Lord. Give us a new passion and a new vision, Lord God, for praying for the lost, Lord, like we have never had before. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, the name of my message was Saved by Faith. And I felt like adding a dash and adding the word only. That is the only way that we are saved is by faith. And there's a lot of things that Paul talked to them. We're going to look at our scripture. First scripture is going to be in Galatians 5, where he is admonishing people to not turn back to legalism. And so many churches, even Pentecostal and full gospel churches, a lot of them still believe in a lot of legalism. I have been in some in my lifetime. All right, Galatians 5, 1 through 12. The main thing, theme of this particular scripture is that spirituality is to be maintained by faith and not subjected to legalism. All right, Galatians 5, 1 through 12 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. This is kind of a long reading, so if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to it. Uh, 1 through 12, and I am reading from the NIV. So you might have a little different version, but it should read close to the same. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all, none at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. If you who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. But by faith, we eagerly await through the spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Christ Jesus, neither one has any value. Hallelujah. The only thing that, uh, that counts in faith is faith, expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. We cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? I'm having trouble with light up here. And I know she kept fooling with my lights. I'm going to move this over more. <laughs> says, you were running a good race. So who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. How many of you have ever made bread? And you know how that works. This is the same thing in spiritual things. You just get just a little something wrong in there. And first thing you know, it can explode and grow. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Render themselves impotent. That's what that means. Praise God. Paul spoke pretty plain language here, didn't he? You know, sometimes I think that in our churches that we try to be too nice and too kind and too polite to people. We need to tell it like it is. We're getting in some serious end times here very soon. And you know, God has revealed to me in a greater measure than ever before how horrible, how horrible, horrible, horrible hell is going to be for so many people. We've got to, he has put, has put a new passion in my heart to pray for people like never before. I mean, there are so many people that think that they're doing good, that they've got these sh uh, long sleeves, long hair, and all of that jazz, thinking that this is going to make them righteous. You know, I was in a church like that. I actually had to sign a paper stating I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that. This was an Assembly of God church, a full gospel church, and it was many years ago. But nevertheless, that's what legalism is. God has set us free from all of these things, and we need to maintain that freedom, and we don't just add to it 
either. A lot of people add things to it. They think that it's gonna make them better if they just eat vegetables only and no meat. How does that make you better? They think, but, but you know what, this gives you a false sense of superiority making you feel like, hey, I'm a little bit more special here because I'm refraining from this, or I'm refraining from that. It does not, does not do one thing to our spirituality. It does not give us any points with God whatsoever. It does not make us any more religious. It does not make us any more righteous. Only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ and walking by faith is the only thing that's going to get us in. It's not by our works. We can do all these good works and we're supposed to do good works. God has called us to do good works. Do I have that scripture here? Let's see. May, I probably have it somewhere here. But God exhorts us to stand fast in our liberty in Christ. To stand fast in it. He is just, uh, these Galatians had really started out uh, in the word, they have started out walking by faith. And first thing you know, there was people coming into their midst, some special speaker or somebody coming in and saying, well, you know what? You really need to obey the things of the law. We Jews had to do it for years. So why shouldn't you Christians have to do it now? It was a burden to them. They could hardly do it for themselves. And now they're trying to bring the Christians under that same bondage. G uh, Paul had a real revelation. If there was ever a person that had a background, a feeling like that maybe that, that that the law was important, it would have been Paul. Paul was this person that he had just, he had been taught under the best teachers of the law. He had been taught, taught by Gamaliel, which was one of the greatest preachers of his time or teachers uh, under the law. And he had been from the time he was a small child. So he knew the law really well. And that's why he persecuted these Christians because he thought that this was, uh, this was a strange move that was not of God. And that's why he persecuted them to begin with until God revealed himself to him, until Jesus revealed himself to him and transformed him and changed him. And when he did, Jesus himself taught him. What a wonderful blessing to have been taught by Jesus himself. Whenever he went off, the Holy Spirit taught him. He sent him off to Arabia. He didn't consult with the Jews at Jerusalem. He didn't consult with the, all the other apostles and everything and say, hey, what's this all about? Tell me about it. Tell me how to, how to do this. He didn't do any of that. He didn't even go to any of their churches. First of all, they didn't want him right then. They still was afraid of him. So God got him out of the, out of the area completely so he alone could teach him. And he alone began teaching him the right, the truth. And so here Paul was in a situation where he couldn't get back to Galatia right now. I'm, you know, I'm not sure if he was in prison at this time or if he was on another missionary journey whenever he wrote this. I believe he was in prison at the time he wrote this particular letter. But anyway, whenever he was writing to them, he could see that they were already, already they were starting to pick back up and pick up legalism again because all of these preachers were in there telling them that they had to do it. And, you know, so we have come a long ways. The church has come a long ways, but yet we are so far behind also. We have really, it seems like there was a time whenever the church was really progressing, and then the dark ages came along, and we're kind of struggling to get out of the dark ages. And there's been times when it's been kind of like a, a sort of a, a boom in the church again that's come forward, and then it kind of falls back. Well, kind of right now in a place where I think that we're kind of standing in the standing kind of on the fence, you might say, where it's going to go one way or the other. But I believe that we are still going to see Joel 2 fulfilled in these last days. We're still going to see that. But are we going to be a part of it? You know what? We still, it still is a matter and a condition of our heart. And God has been impressing upon me anymore that we need to pray as though everything in heaven and earth depends on our prayer our individual prayer. I realize that, that it depends on all of our prayers collectively, but we need to pray earnestly like everything depends on us. And if all the Christians, all of God's people will start praying like this, we will start seeing things happen. And you know, right now, miracles are happening throughout the world. Why are they not happening really heavily right here? Our prayers make a difference. Our prayers make a difference. I have learned that no matter what God has promised in his word, no matter what God's promised in his word, we still have to ask for it. We have to ask in faith, believing, and then we will receive it. He doesn't just pour it out on us whenever, randomly, unless we're ready for it. It's the same thing with your children. If your children are not ready for a new car yet, you're not gonna give a new car to a five-year-old or whatever. You know, whenever they get old enough and they start asking for it, then you know that they're getting ready for it. 
but they've got to start asking. And anything that we give our children, we wait until they usually ask for it because you don't just give them things whenever they're not ready for it. And when you ask, that's when you know you're ready for it. So our Heavenly Father says to ask. How many times in scripture he tells us to ask for things? Boy, I'm getting away from my scripture already and I'm gonna lose my place. So if we are led by the Spirit, we're not under the law. These are the things that don't let people bring into bondage. These are the things that we have faith, that we have in faith. Faith brings liberty, works brings bondage. Just remember that. Works brings bondage and faith brings liberty. And we want to stay in liberty. Joseph Prince said that legalism rearms the enemy. Rearms the enemy. If he can caught us up in just good works, he knows we're going to be lost because we're only going to be saved by faith. We're only going to be saved by faith. There's a lot of people out there in the world today that are lost right now already. They're walking in faith. And the th sad thing is, and I know some of these people personally, they are good people, really good people. I had some people just in my office the other day just telling me all about all the great things that they're doing. And then I come to find out that they're Mormons. And I, all of this, and you know, it's just suddenly I thought, oh my God, these people... They are so caught up in what, what they're doing and they think that they're doing so many good works and all of these things are of God. And, and I know that they, they really, this is what they're trusting in, is in their good works. They actually have rules in their church. And you know, we had some little, uh, some young Mormon boys work for us one time at the food bank. The people loved them. They carried their boxes out for them. They were polite, yes ma'am, what can I do for you? They were so polite, everybody just loved them. But they, are not walking by faith. No, they're not true. walking by faith. They think they can earn their way. Oh my God, and God, hell is gonna be full of these people. They're gonna be full of them if we don't really start crying out, praying for these people and realizing God has given us commission. He has given us a commission to reach these people for, for Jesus and we need to be pray for them. That scripture that says pray for all men, I've gotta to try to find my scriptures and find out where I am here or I'm not gonna have any. I'm gonna have any scriptures left. Okay, Christ, and because of our sins were laid upon him and the blood that he shed on the cross for us, that's what saved us. It was because of his blood. I just wrote a letter to a precious woman that is of one of these cult religions. And I told her, I said, you know, in this letter, the one thing that God impressed me, I just prayed about it ahead of time. God, how do I word this letter? I've been praying for these people for years. And I said, you know, you believe in the Old Testament. You believe that uh, all the things that they did in the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals and everything. And that's because blood has to be shed for the remission of sins. And the Old Testament, they had to do this once a year to stay right with God. But now Jesus has come and he has shed his blood once and for all. Yes. And because of that, we don't have to do those other things anymore. We don't have to do any of them. We are now saved because of the blood that Jesus shed. And right now, there's a lot of religions trying to say that you don't have to pray in Jesus' name. You don't have to talk about the blood. Well, it, otherwise, go ahead and go to your churches and worship God. Well, what good, what is there left? There is nothing left if we don't believe in Jesus' name and we don't believe in the blood of Jesus. Those are the two things that our whole salvation is based on. And we have to believe that it was because of Jesus' shed blood that he reconciled us back to God, that he redeemed us. And then we also have to believe that everything that we do is in Jesus' name. It's not in our name. It's not because of our works. There is no good in us. There is no good in mankind. The greatest good person on earth is nothing, is absolutely nothing whenever it comes to the sight of God if we do not receive Jesus as our Savior. And his mercy is so wonderful. His mercy is so, he is so full of grace and so full of mercy to us because we would be nothing without him. I have learned to pray for grace every single day People, you need to pray for, did you know that there is grace and then there is more grace and then there is abundant grace? The Bible speaks of abundant grace. How many of you think you need abundant grace? I know I need abundant grace daily. That's what helps keep me through going through the day that I can try to, try to stay ready with a word. Anytime a person has a problem that I can stay ready with a word. Did you need a seat, a place to sit? Oh. Okay, all right. 
I just want to make sure we had plenty of chairs here. Yeah, that's right. She's right there. Oh, She's okay. Right All right. God bless you. So we need to pray daily. I believe that we all need to pray daily. Every morning before we leave the house, God, give me more of your grace today. More of his grace helps us to stay, to stay in that place where we can be more pleasant to people, where we can kind of be a little bit more kindly in our responses to people, because a lot of troubles have us. Satan will come at us with every barrel he can throughout the day. I also cancel all of his plans in the morning before I leave the house. I cancel them in the name of Jesus. And we have to pray in our intercession group. Somebody said something about the military can no longer pray in the name of Jesus. And I said, then why pray at all? Who else's name are you going to pray in? I mean, do you think that somebody else is going to come to the rescue? No. Jesus is the only one that has any power to do anything for us. And we must pray in his name because it's the only, only way that we're going to get anywhere. So um, in hell, I want to tell you a little bit about hell. You know, in this life, we have all of God's provision he has provided for us. First, the first thing that we have is breath, right? We have his breath. We have a spirit in us and we have that breath while we're here on earth. In this life right now, we have breath, we have provision, we have food. He's told us to pray for our daily, our daily food and our daily provision and we can pray that in the Lord's Prayer. But he provides all these things for us. We're never hungry. In America, thank goodness, I don't think there's many people in, in, in America really going hungry. And, and we have water to drink and we have all of his blessings and everything. But in hell, you are constantly hungry because, let me tell you about the soul. You know, the soul is where the feelings are, the feelings of, of everything. We're, we're a body, soul, and spirit. We're no longer going to have our body, but we're still going to have our spirit. The spirit man still is, is a person. In fact, that's who we are is our spirit. Our body is just a temple that we live in while we're here. Our, our spirit is still alive and real, and our soul is where all of our feelings come from. You're still going to feel hungry. Uh, you're going to have hunger in heaven. You're going to eat in heaven. Did you know you're going to be able to eat? One of the things I learned about food in heaven is, though, that it's all made of light. Of light. You're going to eat, enjoy it, and then it's going to be no more. And when you're through eating, and whatever leftover is, it's just going to disappear. You know, no cleanup. No cleanup. No nothing. Praise God. <laughs> But this is not going to be in hell. They're going to always be hungry. They're going to always be thirsty. They're always going to be trying to breathe because that's a natural instinct born in us. But they're just kind of like little gas, no air, no air. They're all going to be in torment, constant torment. There's no peace. All of our peace comes from God. All of our peace comes from God. All of our well-being comes from God. All of our... Our wholeness comes from God, our health. There's going to be none of this in hell. It is going to be constant, constant torment. There is never going to be any time of rest. This one person that went to hell and saw, uh, saw firsthand what was going on there, she says one of the things that she saw, and this really stayed in my mind, I have not been able to get it out of my head. It was like a steel box or a casket type of a thing. And the person was standing up in this and it was sealed off, but it had holes in it. And these demons would kept poking at the person in, with, that was in the box with these sharp objects and things. See, the demons are being tormented constantly. Demons are tormented all the time. That's why, you know, have you ever noticed that a person that's really tormented, they want to be hateful to somebody else because you want to do to them what, what you're going through. You want them to experience the same thing. Well, these demons that are constantly tormented all the time, they, all they do is torment the people that go to hell. And they're constantly tormenting them. And this person in the casket started to get tired and wanted to try to bend his knees to rest for a second. And he couldn't because there were sharp things poking out all over in the casket or in this box and he couldn't even bend couldn't rest couldn't rest even for a second can you think of this imagine something like this for all of eternity all of eternity where there is never any end there's never any peace there's never any rest there's never a time to lay down your head to take a, a, a nap there's never any time of any hope you never have any hope that it's ever going to be any better my god we shouldn't even want our worst enemies to have to go to hell. Not even your worst enemies. Even when in this life, we know that whenever a person is tortured for so long, they're going to die. 
there's never any second death in hell. I mean, that is the second death. That is it. It's a constant, continual death. You will always, always experience pain, always experience misery. We need to get this vision down in our hearts to where we are so concerned about the lost that we think about it day and night. We need to pray earnestly, not only for our own households and for our own families and for the people that we love and those around about us, but we need to pray for all men. The scripture tells us to pray for all men. Where is that? Here it is in 1 Timothy 2.1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, applications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Turn two pages. Hold on a second. And then also 2 Peter 3.9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. It is not God's will to send people to hell. It is not God's will for people to go to hell under any circumstances. Hell was not made for man. But that's the only other place there is to go. Only in heaven light would, would kill, would destroy them. The, his brightness and his light would destroy anybody that isn't under the blood of Jesus, that has not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, cannot survive in heaven. It's not a matter of whether you can or can't go there. You cannot survive in heaven if you are not been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. All the good works in the world is not going to count for anything because it's only whenever God sees the blood, when he sees the blood, that's the only thing that's going to matter. So we have, to be, we have to be redeemed by the blood. And that's the one thing that Satan fights. He fights talking about the blood. He fights talking about the name of Jesus. These two things. Churches are full today of people that don't believe in the blood of Jesus and do not believe in the name of Jesus. And this is what we have got to pray for these people like never before. Any opportunity that you get, it doesn't matter what they think about you. You know what? The, you might say one word that might can make a difference in these people's lives that might save them. And I pray that this letter that I sent to this person that somehow, even one word, I just pray afterwards, I say, God, let just something there, something hit home to her to make her think about it all night long, to not be able to sleep, to think on that one thing and wonder about it enough to do something about it because that's all we can do, all we can hope for. And I pray, when I pray for people, I say, God, let them hear anything. Let them hear even a word in a song. It's amazing the things that can turn people around. Just a word in a song, something that you say, something make them curious about you to ask you. How, why you believe like you do. I try to give an opportunity every time I go, whenever I was in there getting all, all these IV treatments for my foot, whenever I had this infection, I gave every one of them a copy of my book. And you know what? Even before I gave them a copy of my book, some of them were asking me for it. And, and a couple of them came by and says, I, I, heard, I heard that you're, uh, that you're a pastor. Where did you hear that? I never told them that I was. I don't know where they heard this, but it got throughout the whole thing that everybody... Uh, said that I was a pastor and a Christian, and so people were beginning to ask me about things. You know, if you let your light shine, somebody is going to realize that you're something different. You're somebody different, and some people are going to be curious enough to ask you. Now, I know that this one woman, I know that everybody I gave that book to, maybe except for one, did not believe like I believe, but I don't care. You know, I tell about there my Holy Ghost experience receiving the tongues. I re talk about salvation when I receive Jesus. I talk about all these things. Now, many of them probably do not believe in this. They probably don't know that. But they are going to know it when they read my book. So anyway, I'm hoping. And some of them came back and asked me for a second copy, asked me for another one for a friend. Well, so I know that there were some of them that it spoke to them. But anyway, we need to try to say anything that we can anything that we can to somebody in hopes to win some. When he said pray for all men, we are to pray for all men, evil men and good men, not just Christians. This same person that I sent this letter to, I know they believe that that scripture means that you only pray for other people that are Christians, that are other people that are preachers, or other people that are missionaries, but that are doing God's work. Not all people. Oh, you don't pray for all those evil people. Why would you pray for them? You pray for them because we want God to save them. We pray for them that they will come to the light and the understanding and knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
And so when I found out they have a totally different Bible, and in their Bible they left that out about praying for all men. You know, I, and I want to tell you, I mentioned it to two or three people, but this is really important because there are some very, very evil people in the world, but that doesn't mean they can't be saved. You know, God has saved some of the most evil people. Look at Paul the Apostle himself. He is a great example how that somebody that was on the wrong track, he was living by works, wasn't he? Man, he was living by works and he was doing it right. He was doing everything that he thought that he was supposed to be doing. He could not, there was nothing that he fell short in of all the things that he did. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he said. And that meant that he was just really, he was adamant and whenever, and, and he was trying to kill and destroy Christians because he thought he was doing God a favor. He was very passionate about his religion. And a lot of these people are too. But that doesn't mean that God cannot save them. I keep asking God people that I can't reach or talk to. I keep asking God, reveal yourself to them, Lord. Reveal yourself. You, he can do that. He can reveal himself. I know a man that one time, he was telling, giving his testimony. He was a minister at the time that this happened. But he said he had been a hopeless alcoholic. He had been, such, he had been so, so down and so, so down in the dumps. I mean, he was really in a pit. And he decided he was just going to kill himself. And he was sitting on the edge of his bed, and he had a shotgun in his hand, and he had it just ready to pull the trigger. And he said, Jesus appeared to him, Whoa. appeared to him in his bedroom and said, Jack, you don't want to do that. That's all he said to him. Changed his life forever. And he became a minister of God. You know, we can pray that way. We can pray, God, reveal yourself to that person. I remember my father, for instance. My father, now he really did believe in the word of God. He believed in God. He was, when he was young, he was raised in a Methodist church. And he's told me one time, he said, you know what? Whenever I went to the Methodist church, said, we have what you have today. We had, says the Holy Ghost would fall in that place. People would roll all over the floors. You talk about holy rollers, we had them. We had holy rollers. <laughs> But he had a bad, he went into the service and when he came back, he was an alcoholic and he could not, he would work for a while. I mean, he wasn't a constant alcoholic. He was the kind of an alcoholic that he would maybe work for two years and be clean, everything. Something or other would happen. And I'm sure that he would got dreams and other things. He imagined things because when he was drunk, he imagined some of the weirdest things. And would tell me that one time told me that my cousin was, had been killed in the service because he had just joined not too long before that. And I think he began worried about him because he remembered his own experiences or something like that. And he told us that and he hadn't. And as far as I know, he might still be alive today. You know, he, he hadn't died or anything else, but he would imagine these things. And uh, he never beat us or abused us when he, was, when he was like this. But whenever he decided to get married again, and I don't know why I'm getting on this subject, but I'm telling you, God can deliver you if you get a vision or if you want to bad enough. And a lot of these uh, addicts and these drugs, the, a lot of them, they can. They can, if they call out to God for help and ask God to help them, they can, I believe that they can overcome it themselves if they have a reason to, a bad enough reason. Well, he found somebody that he wanted to marry and he wanted to marry this person. They had set a date and everything, but she came, happened to come by one time and saw him on a Sunday and he was drunk. And she just flat told him, says, you know, she sobered him up and everything. And then afterwards said, look, he says, she said, you cannot have me and the devil too. And that was it. And he wanted to marry her bad enough, he quit drinking. Now you can do it if you want something bad enough in place of that. But he said one time in their life, they'd been married for several years. One time he was driving along the street and there was a bar there and he was really tired and just felt like started to pull into that, pull in and go into the bar. And he said, a voice just spoke to him and said, Dick, you don't want to do that. And that's all it was. And he says, I just kept straight, stayed on the road and just kept going. And he said, then I know I was really delivered at that point. But you know what? God sees our heart. And when you really want to do something bad enough, he sees your heart and he can deliver you from it. I firmly believe that. I know that I had a really strong addiction, believe it or not, to hard candy whenever I was young. Now, you might think that's a strange addiction, but I mean, it was running my health. My doctor had told me, says, if you don't quit eating sugar like this, don't quit eating the sugar, it's going to kill you. I had already had several passing out experiences and spells. He says, one of these times you're going to pass out and go into a coma and never wake up. And I just, my breakfast in the morning, I would get, get up and get ready to go to work and I would grab a bag, uh, a handful of candy and that's what I ate on the way to work. Through the day, I was a typesetter and uh, through the day, 
in order to keep going, I just kept a little sugar, a little candy, usually, uh, and I don't know why I like, it had to be hard candy. I don't like chocolate. I didn't go for anything like that or even pastry or nothing. I don't like cookies. I didn't like cake or nothing else. Had to be hard candy. My favorite was lemon drops. Man, I just had to keep something in my mouth all the time and keep that going. And sometimes I absolutely could not concentrate on what I was doing. I'd have to stop if I ran out and went to go get some more before I could finish the job I was working on. It was really an addiction. It really was. It was and so I can understand, because of that, I can understand how that people can be so addicted to drugs and to alcohol that they can't break free from it. But God can deliver you from it if you want to bad enough. And I remember that after the doctor told me that, and that's that I had been at a restaurant and I passed out in this restaurant. and. Um, I just sat there, I remember, I don't know where Bob was, he wasn't at home for some reason, or he was in the other room outside or somewhere, but I was alone in the kitchen, and I sat there at that kitchen counter, and I just said, God, I can't do this on my own. I cannot stop this, and I know it's killing me, and I know that I need to get me delivered from this, and I don't know what to do. I said, you're going to have to help me, and I just poured my heart out before God. The next morning, I was already at work when I realized I hadn't got any candy and I didn't want any. 20 years, never touched it, never touched it. Praise God. And you know, something that you can do if you want to do it bad enough, but you've got to realize it's killing you. Drug addicts are dying every single day and going to hell. God, we have got to really pray for these people that somehow they get some help. And you know, I believe, I firmly believe, this is way off of my subject here, but I firmly believe that if our government wanted to stop these drugs bad enough, yes. that they could do it. There's too many people getting cuts off of all of this in high places, and I know it. I know that's what's keeping it going. They don't want to stop it because it's money to them. Money has just become the ruler of this world in such a bad way. People covet money like, like it's just absolutely God. It's their idol. And I, you know, we were talking yesterday, I was talking to my husband last night, and there was something that I was gonna a I ask him what he wanted for his birthday, and anyway, he, ne he always says, I don't need anything, I don't want nothing. Well, there was something I was gonna get for him. He said, that's too much money. And I said, it's just money. I says, what are you gonna just die and we're gonna leave it to all to our kids for them to blow? I said, uh, <laughs> I says, <laughs> sorry, Lynn. <laughs> but you know what, uh, I believe, I said, you know, there's, can you think of all the billionaires, the millionaires in the world, the billionaires in the world that could be putting their money to some really good use and yet they have an obsession for more, for more, for more. And the more you have, the more you want. Yes. It's a lottery yes. You know, I remember one time, and, and they just keep piling it up and piling it up, and one of these days they're going to die. And then somebody's going to get it that's probably going to squander it all. All the hard work that they went to. But, but this is totally off of But I do want it. Something came to my mind that I've got to tell you about. This was in church. This was a young man. He didn't have a job. And God, and he was praying and asked God for a job. He went to this pastor, this is a true story. He went to the pastor, asked him to pray with him, to help him to find a job. And that he, he says, oh, and I find a job, believe you me, I'm gonna be faithful in tithing. I just, I, I, I really want a job so bad and I'm gonna be faithful in everything that God has me to do. And uh, says, I really wanna make this job. That reminds me kind of something about ask uh, your prayer to me and I will answer thee and thou shalt pay thy vow. How many times have you prayed a prayer and said, God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do so-and-so? You know, he expects us to pay those vows afterwards. Don't ever make a vow to God and not, not keep it. Anyway, this man got a job and began paying his tithes. Everything was going along really well. He was living for God. He was doing everything he needed to do. God began prospering him. He began making more and more money. And then first thing you know, he went to the pastor again one time and he said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me that God will help me to be able to pay my tithes. He says, I just can't seem to pay my tithes. And so he said, well, well, what seems to be the problem? He says, well, it was easy to pay my tithes when I was just making a small amount of money because like $10 out of 100, that wasn't that bad. But he says, now I'm making thousands of dollars and it's just really the tithe is getting so big I can't pay anymore. So the pastor began to pray for him that he would lose his job and he would get another job starting over making only $40 a week <laughs> so he could be faithful in paying his tithe again. 
So, you know, sometimes, and that's the way it is whenever you begin to get a lot of wealth. God wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to have wealth. But we also need to be faithful to him. Whenever he starts prospering us, we need to be responsible. We have a great responsibility. And when God answers our prayer, we have a responsibility to do the right thing concerning what we have. So if it's money in our pocket and somebody else has a need, don't hang on to that so tightly that you can't help somebody else in need because you don't know how long your time here on earth is going to be. We know the story about the man that built all these barns and everything and that he was going to build bigger barns because he had so much prosperity that he didn't have room for it. So he was building more and building more and he didn't know what, to, what he was going to do. And that night he died. He lost it all. He didn't have anything anymore. He lost all of it and he didn't put God first so we know where he is today. Oh God, you know when somebody dies, that's the first thought I think of is where are they now? You know, our soul lives forever. We are going to live somewhere forever. All of our loved ones, those people you meet on the street, in the street corner, they're going to live forever. And at some point in time, they're going to perish. They're going to die. And they're going to be, dis uh, they're going to be destroyed. And we bring a lot of destruction on ourselves because we don't make the right choices. But there's a lot of people that were not raised like some of us were raised. A lot of kids that just raised themselves. And I have seen some of these. They were never taught anything. They were never even taught right and wrong. You know, I had a granddaughter like that. Her, her father kidnapped her when she was really little. And finally, she came back into our lives when she was about 12 or 13 years old. She didn't even know what was right and wrong. She just said that it, all you have to do is just keep from getting arrested. But to her, that's all there was to it. She had no concept of what was right and wrong. And if you don't think she wasn't a handful, but praise God. And you know what? She has a little bit of a problem with her mind, I think. However, I've noticed that every time when they've come out here to visit, every time she's in church, she always raises her hand for the altar call, always. And she started going to church, but she says that she'd been going to St. Vincent de Paul Church because they helped her out financially. She doesn't seem to under, she can't seem to get into the word and really understand the word. Even, even the uh, probation officer told me one time, she said, there's something wrong with her thinking. And she says, I cannot put my finger on it. But it's like, she's just like an innocent going through life that doesn't seem to be able to um, get the depth of anything get the depth of anything in school. But yet, whenever she was taught, like in school, she did actually pretty well. She could learn things, but they can't even pinpoint what it is that's wrong with her thinking. But she has something there, but she still loves God. And you know what? God meets us where we are. And if, he, if we love God and our heart is towards him, uh, it, it doesn't matter if she isn't going to a Pentecostal or full gospel church. It doesn't matter if she's going to a charismatic church or even a Catholic church. God looks on our heart. He does not care so much about what church we're going to. So even these people that sometimes we think we got to convince them to come to church with us, just pray for them that God will reveal himself to them, that they'll be saved. I have a brother right now. Yes. About your granddaughter? Yes. Her simplicity is what speaks to somebody that only understands simplicity. That's exactly right. Some, sometimes I think that simplistic attitude is received better by a lot of people than people that, that come across as being too smart and too wise. <laughs> yeah, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I know that um, her life is just a tremendous, uh, I mean, I, I can't believe all the things that she's gone through. She almost died when she was about 12 years old because she was in a wheat field where the weed had grown up real high and she had run away from home and she was sleeping there. And this farmer, he was running his tractor and he said he just happened to catch the color of something or other and stopped and found out it was a child laying there in the field. And uh, she had no idea and, you know, e easily he could have just run right over her. And so, and it was just, she had the most horrendous life. I can't even, I don't even want to go there or even get started on that. But uh, only God knows, and God knows what we've all been through. And it's just like I was telling somebody before. I was counseling with them just recently, and I said, you know, it doesn't matter what your childhood was like. It doesn't matter what other things have done to you. 
What did Paul the Apostle said? He said, forgetting those things that are behind, pressing on to those things that are ahead. And that's what we have to do. We have to forget all of that past and we have to get on with our life and press ahead to the things that God has for us because he has great and wondrous things for him if we will put him first in everything. Forget about the past and go on. And then also that he was complaining about his job and complaining about something else. And I said, you know what? And God just again gave me a scripture said, he said that we are to be content in whatsoever circumstances that we're in, right? It's hard to be content sometimes when you don't like your job. But God taught me a lesson on that too. Whenever I was younger, if I didn't like a job, I just quit and went and found another job. It seemed like it was always easy for me to find a job. But this one time God said, no, you're not going to quit. You're not going to leave this job. You're going to stay here and you're going to work this thing out. And you're going to treat that person nice and you're going to be kind to them no matter what. And, and because I was just complaining about my boss and all of these things. Well, you know, a lot of bosses aren't very nice. But we have to sometimes do what God tells us to do. There's a time to be a child, it's a time to grow up, to become an adult. The Holy Spirit taught me how to be an adult. Praise God, I mean an adult spiritually. I just, you know, I've made a lot of messes in my life, and, but we still have to just press on and go forward in all of these things. So here, uh, Jude also reminds us of some of the things that the apostle said. In Jude 17, uh, 20 to 23. He says, but you, my dear friends, must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus said. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. They follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. And this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others, listen to this, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. A lot of times people that are so sinful and so hateful, we don't want to pray for them. We don't feel like praying for them. But we have to show great mercy to them just like God showed mercy to us. We have got to pass this mercy on. and We have got to show them the grace of God in us. And sometimes we have to be especially nice to those people that despitefully use us or hate us even. It's amazing what a kindness, uh, what a kind word can do. What a kind word can do, especially to somebody that's been real hateful to you. It can turn, it can just suddenly stop that person in their tracks. And they think, what in the heck? What are they up to? <laughs> have you ever felt that way? Uh, I have felt that way sometimes. And sometimes, and I've always, when I was young, I had a very suspicious mind of everybody. I always thought if somebody was kind to me and said a kind word to me, I thought, what is it they want? What's really behind this? I had a really bad suspicious mind. It took the Holy Spirit or God to come to reveal to me, just be who you are, be who I say you are, trust me, and don't worry about what anybody else thinks, says, or does. And you know, we have got to get to that place. And I remember one time, especially, I was telling Rebecca this last week. I said, for some reason, when I was young, I was also very quiet and very timid. I never spoke up or talked to anybody about anything. I was afraid to ask anybody questions because I thought they would lie to me or that maybe they didn't know and they would just make something up and I still wouldn't know the truth. So I trusted in books a lot. I read books a lot and I trusted in those. But there was a time in my life after I was filled with the Holy Spirit that God just really kind of spoke to me and he says, I want you just to obey me, just to do whatever I tell you to do, even if it sounds foolish, even if it sounds like, what sense does that make? Just do it if I tell you to do it. And he said, if I tell you to slam your arm against the wall, just do it. You know, sometimes the things that God tells us don't make sense. They might not make sense to us at the time, but he is working on something. And you might be just a little bit of the puzzle, a little bit of the piece there that he's utilizing to help work out a bigger problem somewhere. And by you just being who you are, always staying in your place, doing the things that God's called you to do, might work out something in a greater realm, in a greater area where God is doing something that's fantastic. 
So just always be aware of that. Be who you are and always be obedient to God and be faithful. He says, we, he is looking for people to be faithful. I can't see that clock. Does anybody know what time it is? It's 10 minutes? Okay, praise the Lord. So that, the words of snatching them from the fire, whenever I was thinking about people like that, this scripture came to me one day, how that we need to just, we need to concern ourselves with where they're headed if they continue doing what they're doing, rather than be concerned with what they are doing. And we need to pray for them no matter what. And what was that scripture, Jude what? 23, Jude 23. There's only, there's only one chapter in Jude, so it's just Jude 23. So when we are snatching them from the fire, we're going to show them mercy, right? That mercy is what's going to do it. That grace, that was what saved us, wasn't it? It was God's mercy, God's grace that saved us. We have to extend that now that we have God in us. We extend that same grace and mercy to others. Whenever, they're, whenever they are doing wrong things, we don't look at what they're doing wrong. Uh, you know, last week I thought about that, that... Was it, was it last week when Rebecca asked the question, what would we do if a Muslim came into our place and said they want to become one of us or something like that? Well, you know, this very thing, and I told Bob about it later, and I said, you know, I would have probably been one of those that just welcomed them with open arms while they placed their bombs in, in different areas around the church. <laughs> Well, you know, the reason I say that, because there is a book that I just read that a very thing like that happened, that these people uh, were some Muslims. It was in a Muslim country. I don't remember exactly where, but, uh, or if it even said in the book, but she was a Muslim and she had been converted and saved. And a lot of her friends had been, and they were in this church. And this was in an area where it was okay to, you could be a Christian. I mean, they were kind of looked down on and hated in their families and everything, but it wasn't outlawed. So I'm not sure exactly what country that was. But so they were having this church service and there was these three Muslims that came in and they had stayed with them two or three times and came into the service and they came forward to pray and they uh, even went through the motions of accepting the Lord as their savior and everybody thought everything was fine. And they did while they were there, they strategically placed bombs at different places in the church. And all of a sudden one morning, those bombs went off and many people were killed. She herself was killed, but God brought her back. And then her testimony goes on after that. Uh, but you know what? We just have to, we have to be able to, whenever people say that they want to receive Jesus as their savior, we have to take them at their word and then we have to trust God. We have to trust God, we have to pray. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, as the saying goes. So we really need to be wise, we need to pray for wisdom, uh, and we need to just keep our eye on them. I would say trust them, but keep your eye on them, okay? That's what the, I think that Beth said something about that, something to that effect back there. Keep your eye on them, especially if they have a notorious uh, reputation, because just like the Muslim that was converted, uh, that, and God revealed himself to him, just suddenly revealed himself to him. He was an ISIS leader. He had killed many people. And he was, he was just in, in charge of a lot of wicked stuff going on. But G Jesus Christ revealed himself to him. And a lot of these people, they do believe in God, in their God. And they believe their God is right. But Jesus revealed himself to him. And he says, I am Jesus. Just like with Paul. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And that man was totally converted and he became a great leader for Christ in his area. And he, and he might be dead today, I don't know. They're living in very dangerous circumstances over there. Many people that are Christians throughout the world do not have the luxury that we have of the freedom that we have here in this country. And they are living uh, daily, daily with a target on their back, daily uh, with a chance of being arrested and persecuted, and daily with the option of whether they're going to deny Christ or be killed. And so we need to really pray for those. God has also put that on my heart to pray for these missionaries and these people in other countries daily with great passion. I mean, pray for them that God would let their faith not fail, that they would be faithful to the end no matter what, because their testimony could save millions. Just their testimony of what they go through could save millions. But God can give them the greater grace that they need. How do you think that the apostles were able to go through all the martyrs uh, of the early church and the things that they went through? Can you imagine Peter saying, no, I don't even want to be crucified like my Lord 
do it upside down. You know, it's just all the things that they went through, God gave them the grace to do that. Where greater grace is needed, greater grace will be given. We just need to make up our minds that no matter what, we are going to be faithful and we're going to do the word of God. We are going to pray for people and we are going to let our light shine and we are going to, we're going to fulfill the calling that God has on our life. We've got to do it, people. We have got to do it. You know, sometimes it seems like heaven almost seems like the more that you think about heaven and the more that you understand what is in heaven and everything, it almost seems like a dream. It doesn't seem possible. But you know what? All things that are not possible with us are possible with God. And I was just telling Bob, I said, you know what? I think I even told him that this morning, or maybe it was yet last night, when we were talking about these things. These things. I said, you know what? In heaven, I'm not going to have a heart. I'm not going to have a lungs. I'm not going to have liver. I'm not going to have any of these inward parts because they're not going to be necessary anymore. So I said, I wonder what's going to be there. You know, have you ever thought about, I think about some of the weirdest things. <laughs> and we're not going to, I said, I'm not going to have to have any intestines or anything. I'm not going to have all of that stuff. So what is going to be there? And then, you know, it's just, my mind goes really crazy sometimes thinking about, if God wanted us to know, he'd tell us. But we just know we're going to be spiritual beings. It's not going to be like on this earth. We're not going to be like. So we've got to realize that, that all of this is going to pass away. All of this flesh is going to be gone. We don't have to worry about our hair in the morning. Everything's going to be perfect about us all the time. Everything is going to be perfect all the time. We're going to be in such perfection. Children will be able to swim underwater and go underwater and without worrying about breathing. No, nobody, there is nothing that can harm you in heaven. Absolutely nothing, nothing that can harm you. You cannot die. You cannot die. Uh, in this one book that I read, it said that there was people out there in the water swimming and they were walking on the bottoms. In fact, this one person was building kind of like some kind of a sandcastle or something underneath in the bottom of the, the water there. Nothing will harm you in heaven. The kids could just do anything, and kids were playing everywhere, and they were just climbing trees, and they were doing everything that kids do. Heaven is a shadow. I mean, the earth is a shadow of what is above. The things that people like and enjoy doing here, you're going to still like it and enjoy it in heaven. And God's going to give us the desires of our heart, anything that we desire to do. It's going to be there. And if it wasn't there before you got there, it'll be there after you get there because it expands, it keeps growing all the time. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm so excited. You know, I, I can't hardly wait to go to heaven, but on the other hand, I know that we have to stay here on this earth as long as God has a plan and a purpose for us on this earth, because if we don't, there's so many people that are gonna go to hell, gonna go to the other place. If we don't stay here and do the things that God has called us to do, and to be faithful in our calling, and to continually trust him. We might feel like we're going through pain and misery. God, I don't wanna go through this anymore, but you know if it's God's will for you to be here and for you to endure that learn to be content in whatsoever state that you are in always Paul remember that he said in beatings and fastings and whenever he whenever he had no food he turned it into a fast and glorified God so you know there was many times that Paul had a lot worse than any of us have ever had he had a lot worse than any of us, and he was still able to glorify God in all of it. And the greater that you glorify God, the greater God is going to move in you to do miracles and signs and wonders throughout to everybody else. And many people are going to be saved from your testimony. Praise God. Hallelujah. I don't even know where to begin next week. Forgive me. I make all these notes. I pray over my notes. And it seems like I just don't even know where I am. Praise God. Praise God. Yes. Well, I can't see the clock, but everybody's getting their books together, so I can only assume it must be time. It's about two minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, it is love. It is love that causes... Uh, causes us to walk in grace. Uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't have that same love. But see, God put that love in our hearts. And as long as we walk in his love, we will be the ministers he's called us to be. But if we get out of love and we get into works, whenever you're walking in works, you can't walk in love. 
Love will cause you to do things that you would not do in the natural. Love will cause you to give $5,000 to somebody in need uh, and, and go without your next meal. Love will do a lot of things that the law did not even require us to do. Praise God. So with that thought, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today, Lord. We thank you, oh God, that you have called us into the ministry, Lord God. And we pray, God, that you found us worthy, Lord. God, that you would even call us, Lord, to preach your word, Lord, to teach, Lord. And God, for every one of these that hear, Lord, every one of them have a calling on their life, Lord. You have called every one of them out of darkness, Lord, into your glorious light, Lord, to do the works that you've called them to do, Lord. And God, you have given every one of us a commission, Lord. Help us to feel, feel those commissions, Lord, and to do the things that you've called us to do and to be faithful, Lord, to the very end. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Faithfulness, faithfulness is important.